Um, I'm very happy that you are joining us here tonight for our speaker. Um, before I begin, I would just like to mention the sponsorship of the Vermont Department of Libraries statewide, who um, work with the Humanities Council to put these programs together. Our speaker this evening, Irene Kakandis, is Professor of German Studies and Comparative Literature at Dartmouth College and is currently Chair of the German Studies Department. She is the author of Daddy's War, Greek American Stories, and Talk Fiction, Literature and the Talk Explosion. She has undergraduate and graduate degrees from Harvard University and has also studied at the Freie Universität in Berlin, Germany, and at the Aristotle University in Thessaloniki in Greece. The author of articles on German and Italian cultural studies, narrative theory, feminist linguistic theory, trauma studies, and Holocaust studies. I'm so excited. I really am. Those are all things in which I'm extremely interested. Her current research focuses on family memory and the Second World War. So please help me in meeting Professor Kekendis. So we're going to just do a few tech things. Um, sound check, is that OK? Can everyone in the audience hear me okay, comfortably? A little louder, sir? OK, great. And um, we also have to, we're missing Chris, but we need to try to get this to. Um, Mouses. I'm just trying to get it to go, but the mouse is not very supple. Okay, great. Okay, good. Oops, I don't think we need everything out, actually. I'd, I'd be more comfortable with the lights okay. on. I think you're going to be able to see the images okay. So first of all, I just want to say I'm uh, really so happy to be with you um, here tonight. Um, Middlebury is a town I have a lot of affection for. I almost uh, was hired here uh, many years ago when I was trying to figure out my private life with a husband who was teaching at the University of Vermont, but I uh, had to make a slightly longer commute and settle for Dartmouth. Um, I also <laughs> want to thank the folks at the Vermont Humanities Council, and particularly Chris, who's, who's just arrived in the room, for those of you who might not know Chris, but I hope you all do, um, for this wonderful invitation. I would just suggest that it's, it seems like a shame to me that colleges and intellectuals in northern New England don't have more regular contact with one another. And though we've just met, I want to signal um, a colleague from the history department because I did decide to reach out to the folks at Middlebury, and I think a few are here or might be coming. Um, in any case, the first Wednesday series is very important to me, both because I adore public libraries. I think that's how the seed for becoming um, an academic uh, was planted in myself. And also because I think it does bring us together and realize that we all live in the same region and it's good to have conversations with each other. I just wanted to pick up on one meeting, uh, one point from the business meeting, which I didn't expect to um, be at, but um, some of you may know that in my area of um, northern New England, uh, we do have a serious homeless problem, as there are in other places in uh, northern New England and the Upper Valley Haven um, has been uh, running, supporting for quite a while a homework club. Um, I actually had a role in getting that started about 12 years ago. And those children are often the recipients of those books. So I just want to encourage you and say thank you and you never know how much uh, a book can mean to a young child who couldn't afford one in any case. Um, a couple other technical things before I get rolling. Um, there should have been near to your seat um, a list of references for the two main topics that I'll really be taking up. Uh, one is related to trauma and one are related specifically to memoirs or analytical material about this concept of inter intergenerational legacy of war. Um, I'm very happy to answer any questions about any of those 
um, reading. Some are more academic, some are more popular. Um, if you have some references you'd like to share with us, that would be wonderful. And finally, um, not quite finally, sorry, uh, penultimately, um, there are some order forms for uh, books I have participated in. Um, this talk was uh, actually slightly mistakenly advertised with the title of my latest book, Daddy's War. Um, in any case, um, that book may, I hope, uh, be of interest to you, especially after hearing this talk. And there is a 20% discount available if you um, order it with using the special code that's on this sheet. So you don't need this sheet, but if you want the 20% discount, just copy down the code. And there are some copies of that there. Um, there's a copy also of an order form for talk fiction, which is a work in which I developed concepts around um, trauma and witnessing <coughs> to trauma that might be of interest to you. But um, particularly salient and a little bit coincidentally, uh, little did any of us know what was going to happen this week, there's also an order form for a book called Trauma at Home, which is a series of very moving essays from very different angles about the tragedy in New York uh, on 9-11. So um, some of you may be interested in that. So now finally, in terms of introductory remarks, I always like to warn audiences, including my students, of what's ahead. Um, I plan to speak for about 40, 45 minutes, uh, fairly formal remarks, but if you find yourself um, feeling frustrated or lost, please just shoot up your hand and um, I will explain something or slow down. Um, and then my hope and my understanding with the overall time frame of the series is that there will be lots of time for discussion because just looking around at this audience, I'm sure you have a lot to teach me too. And uh, along those lines, I'd just like to um, do a little participation right away and say, um, ask how many of you are, are veterans? How many people in the audience? I had a feeling. How many of you have uh, a parent or a sibling or a child who's a veteran? Had a feeling, okay. So I think this affects quite a few of us in the room and that's mainly my point. So now I'm going to uh, begin with the, the more formal remarks. Um, I, in the spirit of trying to get to know each other a little bit better, I do want to say a little bit more about my own background. Um, it was mentioned that I, I did a few degrees at Harvard University. Uh, the PhD was specifically in comparative literature, but my undergraduate degrees were actually in history and literature, which is why I'm particularly thrilled to have some colleagues from the history department. And the contexts for reading literature have always been particularly important to me. Um, at Dartmouth, I also teach in programs like women's and gender studies, war and peace studies, and Jewish studies. And the teaching I do in those programs has a lot to do with history and other ways of approaching problems, um, <coughs> rather than a pure literary one, although I adore literature and I like that approach just fine too. The interdisciplinary field that's closest to my current work is a, a subset of memory studies, a field that's really taken off in the last 20 years, that's usually referred to as trauma studies. And as practiced in American academia anyway, it draws on fields like medicine, psychology, literary and cultural theory, and narrative theory. Um, though I have worked in my career on many different historical periods, the project I'm sharing with you tonight concerns two main periods. Um, the present, uh, since the interviews I conducted for this project were conducted from about 2005 to 2008, and the major event of the 20th century for most Europeans and Americans, that is to say, the Second World War. Um, culture as a context is also very, very important to me. So one context is uh, Greek American, uh, which I would put under um, the category of US immigrant. That might also be something some of us have in common here. And uh, a Greek culture of the mid 20th century, which in terms of gender relations, something I will be addressing throughout the talk, was quite traditional at that time, as you'll see from some specific examples. So what I'd like to do, and those of you who know a lot about this, I hope you'll be patient with those of us who might know a little less, is go over some basic terms. Um, the word trauma has been in circulation in European languages for centuries, but its use in the realm of the psyche is relatively new, actually only about a century old. A short definition for trauma that um, might be useful to you is psychic wounding. 
it can be confusing that the word trauma, at least in English, and especially when we use it in common parlance, refers to both what causes the psychic wounding and to the effect, its result. The medical profession in the United States officially acknowledged a set of symptoms resulting from psychic woundings with the designation post-traumatic stress disorder, which is commonly known by its acronym PTSD. But that only happened in the year um, 1980, something many of us don't realize. The World Health Organization added PTSD to its diagnostic manual in 1993. I'm going to share some more about PTSD in just a moment, but from the term itself, I want you to notice the idea of aftermath, right? Post-traumatic. This idea of the post, <laughs> of what came after, is very much the focus of my research, and that's why you have that intergenerational uh, legacy in my title. Right? I, as any historian, have no direct access to the past. Rather, I try to locate and analyze the traces of what happened to my paternal family in Greece during the Second World War, that is, of course, mid-20th century, as those traces are present in the memories of a large number of family members of two generations in the war's aftermath and up to today, early 21st century. Now, if the diagnosis of PTSD is a quite recent phenomenon, certainly psychic woundings are not. We have all kinds of evidence through myth, religion, literature, and other arts that human beings are and have been for millennia capable of wounding others' psyches and of being wounded psychically. That very word psyche, of course, um, refers back to the myth. The prods to medical attention to the problem were, it is important to note, highly gendered. It was a women's malady that led early researchers like Jean-Marie Charcot, Pierre Janet, Joseph Breuer, and Sigmund Freud to lay the basis for trauma theory through their work on hysteria. And some of you may know that that word itself, uh, uterus, right, um, hysteria, refers to a woman's organ. Uh, which was thought by ancient Greeks already to cause problems for women by wandering to different locations in their bodies. Right? Okay. But we should also note that it was not until men began to display psychic woundings in vast numbers that their, um, that is through their responses to modern warfare, originally so-called shell shock, that the mainstream medical profession began to devote adequate resources to investigating trauma. Another interesting side note that witnesses to the gender dynamics of medical politics um, concerns the fact that at first, men who displayed such symptoms during warfare were considered to be weak, cowards, sissies, in short, not to be real men. When their numbers began to grow with additional and increasingly technological wars and their intended horrors, that attitude changed somewhat, but one I believe can still observe today the stigma attached to PTSD victims among current US veterans. And you may also know that um, the hospital at White River Junction is specializes in PTSD. It's one of the world's uh, centers for PTSD research. Interestingly, uh, for the history of alliances across gender, the real breakthrough in dedication of governmental and medical resources seems to have come through lobbying by mainly female feminists and mainly male Vietnam War veterans. One of the triumphs of this alliance is that designation of PTSD in 1980 that I've already mentioned. I would also like to refer you to a very important study by psychiatrist Judith Herman, Trauma and Recovery, where she outlines more how this alliance um, played out. Now, unlike descriptions of hysteria or shell shock, the definition of post-traumatic stress disorder does not contain anything that I would consider explicitly gendered. I'll take one of the shortest definitions um, avail available on the website of the National Institutes of Health, PTSD is an anxiety disorder that can develop after exposure to a terrifying event or ordeal in which grave physical harm occurred or was threatened. Traumatic events that may trigger PTSD include violent personal assaults, natural or human-caused disasters, accidents, or military combat. 
The Diagnostic Manual of the American Psychiatric Association, the APA, um, makes clear that this, that, that, than the previous definition, that PTSD can result not only from direct assaults on the self, but also from witnessing an assault on another human being, and even from learning about trauma to another, as for instance, in hearing about the violent or unexpected death of a loved one. Some additional points about trauma I'd like to emphasize include that though the definition itself may not be overtly gendered, the common stressors that can bring on PTSD continue to have gendered connotations. Physical violence of inner cities and war still involve more men than women. And domestic and sexual violence continue to be perpetrated more frequently by men on women and children. Relevant here is the fact that violence perpetrated by human beings against other human beings tends to trigger more incidents of PTSD than violence caused by natural forces like hurricanes, tornadoes, or earthquakes, though those certainly can also uh, trigger PTSD. <coughs> now, another way in which gender can be a factor that needs to be taken into any account of trauma concerns the observation that individual psyches can react differently to the very same life-threatening experiences. So if two people are in a car accident, they're not necessarily both going to develop post-traumatic um, syndrome. In the aftermath of the terrorist attacks in the United States, to take one salient example, not all New Yorkers had an equal chance of developing PTSD. Those who had experienced a previous trauma, as well as those subjected to what Maria Root has called insidious trauma, like poverty, racism, and sexism, had a much higher chance of developing post-traumatic syndrome. In that regard, poor colored women are particularly at risk in our Western societies, a subgroup of New Yorkers that, in fact, displayed proportionately higher post-traumatic symptology in the wake of 9-11. And there's a very interesting article in the New England Journal of Medicine that came out shortly after 9-11 that talked about that connection. So what I'd like to do now is probe the official uh, definition of PTSD for affect, and I'm using it in the technical sense now of emotion. Right? Most obviously, a major criterion for diagnosing the disease states that the person's response to the event must involve intense fear, helplessness, or horror. Those feelings can in turn lead to a numbing of general responsiveness, for, in for instance, in diminished interest in previously enjoyed activities, or feeling detached or estranged from other people, or markedly reduced ability to feel emotions at all, particularly those associated with intimacy, tenderness, and sexuality. And all of these count as disturbances of an individual's normal affective behavior. In the affective realm of anxiety or increased arousal, uh, the DSM-4, that's the diagnostic manual I mentioned before, cites irritability or outbursts of anger hypervigilance, exaggerated startle response. To summarize then, some of the main connections between trauma and affect, feelings themselves, like those of distress, fear, shame, hopelessness, impair um, modulating affect, like being unable to tame sudden outbursts of rage, or complete or near complete avoidance of situations that will cause feelings such as not going out of the house, are all ways in which the affective dimension of individuals can be affected in the aftermath of trauma. And I'd just like to pause, pause here for a second to acknowledge that some of us, as I was reading that list, may have friends or relatives in mind as we hear those symptoms. We may have ourselves in mind. Um, we won't uh, pause right now to, to give the specific examples, but I know for myself, I, the examples are jumping out at me even as I read you that definition. So I'm going to change um, gears now um, because I'm going to switch from these general reflections on trauma, gender, and affect to more specific data about the relationship between uh, those three elements. And I'm going to change the tone also partly because I don't want anyone to think that we can formulaically apply theory to an actual situation. Right? So now I'm going to um, narrate in a very different kind of way and I'll uh, make signal that change with this photo for me that is very, very moving. And I will just point out that 
The baby in that picture is my father. Um, the man on the left is his father, my grandfather George, and the woman is my grandmother Lisula, um, whom you can see was quite pregnant at the time, even though the first baby is young. My dad, John George Kakandis, was born in Newark, New Jersey on December 8, 1929. His Greek immigrant parents, pictured here, had four more children, one of whom, the one you see in utero here, died at three months. In July 1937, my grandmother headed out on this ocean liner, the Volcania, to Greece with the four surviving children my father, John, his brothers, Harry and Nick, um, the latter, just an infant, and his sister, Pearl. Okay, so these are the children in the photo that was taken for them for their American passport, which was in my father's name. Now, the cause for this visit was ostensibly to visit the children's parents' families, while one parent, my grandfather, George, stayed in the United States to work and save money so that the couple could buy their own home. My grandmother returned to the United States and her husband with four children alive. This is what the children looked like, but not until October 1945. So again, they left in July 1937, and they could not return to the United States until October 1945, a period of more than eight years in which she and the children had survived world war, occupation, famine, and the start of the Greek Civil War. Because my father was the oldest male child, and I'm going to flip back to that picture just for a minute, because though you can see that he's the oldest, you can also see that he was quite young, he bore the brunt of the responsibility, along with my grandmother, for trying to feed himself and the other children, despite the fact that he was only 10 years old when the war in Greece began, which was October 1940. And we can talk more about the, uh, the uh, how the war unfolded in Greece um, in the question and answer period. And he was 14 when it ended in October 1944. My father John's experiences included long periods of undernourishment, witnessing his maternal grandparents die of starvation, and his mother nearly die of pleurisy, feeling loneliness and fear while living separated from his mother and siblings, please don't forget his age, in Athens, um, begging, selling cigarettes, working for the Italians in a police precinct kitchen, and for the German occupiers as some type of guard, and while working as a deck boy on a requisitioned Greek ship sailing between uh, Piraeus, Patras, and Kekira, which is also referred to as Corfu. Uh, this is one of only two photos I have uh, of my father during the actual war period, and this is while he was sailing on the ship. He had the picture taken in. Um, Patras, which is another major port, so that he could send it to his mother to show her that he was still alive. My father also provided, that's uh, not the ship he was on, which was blown to pieces, but um, it's something probably similar to what he was on. And you'll see that the Nazis requisitioned such ships and flew their own flags. My father also provided information and engaged in some fighting on the side of a British tank regiment against the communist guerrillas for control of Athens and then of Patras after the war against the Germans had actually ended. So this is a picture my dad on that picture in the um, left-hand side is the person furthest to the right. So you can see how much uh, the war had changed, uh, what he looked like. He was uh, barely 15 in that, in that photo. Okay. At some point or points during these years, an accident or act of violence took off part of his toe. And in the same or another event, a wound was inflicted that resulted in a large, thick scar on the tender side of his left arm to speak first of only the physical wounds that I can see now. I believe that even though most of us are not medical or he mental health professionals, we can agree that any one of these experiences might have caused psychic trauma in an adolescent boy. My conjecture is that my father may have suffered at some point in his life from post-traumatic stress disorder stem not from an official diagnosis, which to my knowledge he absolutely never sought or received, but rather from three main sources. 
My father's display of some symptoms of PTSD, specifically his persistent dysphoria and sleep disturbances from nightmares. Second, my sense that I myself possess what Marianne Hirsch has termed post-memory of trauma that I believe was engendered in me due to my father's war experiences. And three, from my analysis as a professional analyst of stories, um, those stories he has been telling have aspects that point to what Pierre Janet and Bessel van der Kolk and uh, Anno van der Hart, following Janet, have called traumatic memory, not narrative or ordinary memory. Such traumatic memory is intransigent. It does not respond well to audience or circumstance. It's also incomplete. As psychotherapist Jody Wigren has pointed out, this incompleteness itself can be a source of post-traumatic distress. And I just mentioned, I realize I'm throwing a lot of names at you, but that's why I had the handout. Those are listed on the back side of that handout. Now, as a researcher, the material I've been working with provides interesting opportunities for fields such as history, narrative theory, and memory studies, and gender studies. Because I have a very large family, I was able to interview numerous relatives about the quote unquote same events. I then organized the stories that had been told to me about events under topical headings, like um, being arrested, or starving, or losing grandparents. Um, and in this sense, I feel that I created what could be referred to as a brain scan of family memory. That is to say, I created a simultaneous view of how certain past events are present today, more exactly in the period I was interviewing, in the memories of a large number of family members of two generations. The findings of that line of research are included in this book. And they concern how gender, age at the time of recital, birth order, and degree of situatedness in the multiple cultures and languages the <coughs> individual straddle affect who was told what, how story recipients remembered what they were told, and how they in turn narrated what they thought they remembered. Uh, one project I'm engaged in now concerns not this synchronous look at family memory, this memory scan, which I've just described, but rather how memory of traumatic events might transform over the lifetime of the narrator. Very unexpectedly, my research uncovered numerous versions of my father's stories that made it into print or were recorded at surprisingly regular intervals from essentially 1945 to 2005. So I pretty much have a version of his story every 15 years or so, over 60 years. So this is the first version that appeared. His father had bought that house um, finally in um, Neptune, which is right near Asbury Park. Um, and he was interviewed very shortly after getting back from Greece. Um, this is an article that appeared in the town uh, paper in the town that I grew up in, White Plains, New York, uh, which you can see is from 1965. Uh, there was another article about him in the school paper um, from uh, the, 1990, um, and then I interviewed my father in 2005. So these narratives provide me with an extraordinary opportunity to consider diachronous transformations of memories of the same events and to ask myself what in the experiences of the storyteller, which includes, of course, the culture in which he is living, might have inflected, indeed precipitated the changes in the narratives. Now, I really I don't take the time now to go through this, but I just want to give you a couple of examples. Um, in this article in the local paper, he uses for the first time the word concentration camp. In the 1945 um, article, that's not present, right? So that must have entered from somewhere. And in other work that I've done, I theorize um, how that got in there. So another project that grew out of this book is what I've already announced to you, a consideration of the way my family corpuses of war stories allows us to um, gain insight into the affects of traumatic aftermaths. Okay? So the affects of traumatic aftermaths. I only have time to illustrate a few points, but perhaps we can get to others in the discussion. 
I'll begin by trying to pry apart two different levels from which these insights are gleaned. On the one hand, there are gendered aspects of the original events, and on the other, there are insights gained from analyzing the tellings themselves. It's not always possible or desirable to keep these two levels distinct, but I'll pretend that we can do it. All right. So now um, you can see I put up some very dramatic maps. Um, this, uh, these illustrate the invasion of Greece and Yugoslavia by the Germans in April of 1941. The Italians had already tried to invade in October of 1940. Uh, they were pushed back by the Greeks. It's one of actually very, very few victories of the Allies in the early period of the war is this pushing back of the Italians into Albania. Um, but then a stalemate sets in with a very, very heavy winter, uh, winter 40, 41, and Hitler cannot risk um, the oil fields of Romania falling into the hands of the British when he is planning the invasion of the Soviet Union, so he decides to come to um, Mussolini's aid. And very quickly, in a blitzkrieg-like fashion, Greece then falls to the Germans um, in about two weeks. Right. Now. Um, Prior to these events, money had been sent from the United States by my grandfather. It stopped reaching my grandmother because of the onset of hostilities. The task of feeding the family fell very heavily on the slim shoulders of my young father because he was the oldest male, even though he was only 10 years old. He stopped attending school, and he started doing absolutely any task by which he could earn money or be paid in food that he could pass on to his mother and siblings. One of these jobs I've already alluded to was that of a mutsos. This is a Greek word for a ship's boy, doing any kind of errand on a small sailing vessel that went up and down the west coast of Greece from the main harbor in Piraeus to Patras. And I just, for those of you who are in, haven't had a chance to go there lately. Um, let's, so here is uh, the main port of Piraeus. Here's Patras, and here's Kergira, right? So this vessel was going through the Corinth Canal, um, through the Corinthian Gulf, and then up um, the coast to Kergira and back. And they made quite a few uh, trips doing that. OK. Sometimes German occupiers accompanied the vessel on these journeys, and sometimes they did not. And it's not clear to me when they were there and when they were not. But evidently, when the Germans were on board, um, locals in Kerkira, in Corfu, right, a place which, according to my father and the history books, the starvation was particularly bad, would try to get food from the Germans by bartering their sisters in exchange. In other words, the brothers would come to the docked ship and ask the German sailors to give them food as the price for sleeping with their sisters. Now, I have some collaboration from testimony on the German side that soldiers liked being in Greece because the local population was so hungry that it was particularly easy to barter food for sex. What I, I want to emphasize here is that for my father, who had been given the premature role of protector of his family, including of his unaccompanied mother and his younger sister, those Greek brothers were committing the worst kind of betrayal. I have reasons to believe that witnessing this betrayal was itself traumatic for my father. So let me jump very briefly to that other level, the level of the telling of such stories. And I want to share with you a few steps in the psychohistorical reconstruction I have done here. I, Irene, had never heard this story of brothers pimping their sisters to German sailors on the Kaiki, which my father worked on during my own childhood, nor have I to this day ever heard it from my father himself. Rather, one day in the fall of 2005, after my first trip to Greece to collect stories for this project, I was sharing some of what I had learned with my mother. I think it's highly relevant to note that we were not in my mother and father's home in New York when I conducted, where I had conducted a lot of interviews with them, but rather in Berlin, Germany. Berlin is a city I know particularly well and in which I have the privilege to teach on a semi-regular basis. But my mother was visiting there for the very first time and she had come without my father who was already sick at the time. 
Specifically, I was recounting to my mother that I had asked interviewees in my father's area of rural Greece, which I had just visited, if the occupiers had raped local girls. Why was I asking that question, you might well ask. Because I myself, remember I had never heard this story that I've already shared with you, but I myself had grown up with a petrifying fear of rape. That, I figured out in my own early adulthood, must have had something to do with my father's wartime experiences in Greece, but I did not know what. When, a few decades later, I went in pursuit of what those experiences could have been, all my local Greek informants insisted to me that neither the Italians nor the Germans had raped local girls. I did eventually discover, by the way, this is just an interesting historical side note, that um, there was, were forced sexual relations during the Greek Civil War. Um, but this is not the period we're talking about right here. So in thinking out loud to my mother about how it could be that my father was obsessed with fear of family members being raped, and yet no one in the region could recall such a thing occurring, I wondered if perhaps my father had witnessed a rape, not when he was in the village, right, but rather when he was alone in Athens. So I just want to point out that um, I described to you where that ship went before. My dad's area, I'm not sure, do we have a pointer? No. Okay. So um, the most famous area here, a town is Delphi for sure. Um, my dad's family was living in Itea. My grandmother was from this village, Chrysa, and my grandfather was from this village, Kolopetinitsa. So I interviewed people in this whole larger area, and everybody, which was very um, active with resistors to the Germans, but also um, suffered very tragically in uh, the Greek Civil War. Okay. Um, so what I was uh, asking my mom is, how could it be that all the people in this area told me nobody was raped here? Okay, um, and that forced me to think, okay, so um, he didn't see something there. He's, uh, this is what the area looks like today, by the way. It's absolutely spectacular. Um, that's referred to as the Sea of Olives. There are more than two million olive trees um, in, this, in this area. Um, so it didn't happen there in that beautiful place. It happened um, in Athens. And this is the only other photo I have, I have of uh, my dad during the war years. Um, this was taken in order that he could get some employment with the Germans, and he had borrowed the clothes. Okay, um, But you can see a little bit. My dad is actually quite light in coloring, unlike um, myself. He has blue eyes and, and had very, very light brown hair at the time. Okay. Um, so I surmise this didn't happen in the village, it happened in Athens. It was at that moment that my mother recounted to me this story about my father witnessing the pimping of sisters by their brothers in Kerkira. She narrated sometimes in Greek and sometimes in English, which I consider another revelatory detail. When my mother reached the point in the story that we call the evaluation, and here you have, I'm sorry it's so small, but I just wanted to give you a little bit of a shape of what that interaction looked like. And uh, Daddy's War is filled with these transcripts, which is fairly unusual for publishing. Um, we can talk about that later. There's some things that will seem um, incomprehensible. That's an English transliteration of, of the Greek. OK, so when my mother got to the point that we would call the evaluation, she not only quoted my father's words to her in English, but also in a suddenly outraged tone of voice that literally sounded like my father. I jumped because the sound of her voice resembled the sound of my father so much. Can you imagine, he used to say, can you imagine? She then repeated something from an earlier part of the conversation. That is, that on her island, they did not have negative experiences with the occupiers. And she and I then pursued a very different thread of my investigations concerning my father's hatred of the Italians. Now, there are several issues related to trauma narrative I'd like to draw your attention to through this memory of Kerkiran brothers pimping their sisters. For one thing, notice the way that it seems to jump out of nowhere. 
I've done quite a bit of work with testimony from Holocaust survivors. And there, as in my corpus of interviews related to the war in Greece, survivors often comment that they are remembering a stretch of narrative as if for the very first time. I say as if because, of course, such convictions about one's own memory can't be independently verified. In any case, this was the type of experience my mother was having in my living room that day in Berlin. The story that my father had shared with her at some point during their early acquaintance in the 1950s in the United States, my parents met in Ithaca, New York, where my dad was in school and my mother had come to stay with her brother, had stayed buried in my mother's consciousness for about half a century, popping out at the specific moment when she heard me wondering out loud what my father could have experienced that would eventually cause him to make one of his daughters so afraid of rape. I'd like to add here that my mother claimed she was unaware that I had been so worried about rape and that she could not think of how or when my father would have instilled that in me. Now, while the topic of how memories are actually stored in the brain is not one I'm going to have time to unpack with you here, I want to draw your attention to the particular way my mother went back and forth between Greek and English during this recital. Again, based on my experience of listening to many oral narratives, it had the quality of almost a recording, as if lifted directly from the time and place in which she had first heard it from my father a time in which her own English was fairly limited and in which she would have fallen back on Greek frequently, the way she did in narrating to me that day in Berlin. Most important for my purposes here, the particular quality of her voice when she repeated my father's incredulity about what the brothers had done, can you imagine, can you imagine, made me conclude that this experience of witnessing pimping of family members by family members had marked my father deeply, even traumatically. Although my mother's affect was fairly calm while she was relating this story to me, other than when she was saying, can you imagine, I surmise that hearing it from my father at the time that she originally did could not have been a casual experience for her, as she had just arrived in a strange new country, um, that is, in the United States from Greece, and was, for all intents and purposes, in her brother's and soon after in her new husband's care. So this parallel situation to the sisters on Kerkira in the care of their brothers. Right? At the very least, my mother must have been upset by, at the time by learning that some of her countrymen had behaved in this way during the war. Though she did not witness this kind of betrayal herself on her island, she did experience other kinds of betrayals, including one of, by her sister, which in turn led to a terrible beating of my mother by her father. Now, as fascinating as this dense web of connections is to me, and I hope mildly to you, and as many more layers of it that I could add, I need to make another jump, and one that will bring us closer to our own day. It's appropriate here to introduce another concept related to traumatic aftermaths, and that is the concept of post-memory. And just out of curiosity, how many of you have heard that term before? Is it something? <laughs> just a few of you. OK. So um, this term was coined by my colleague and very dear friend, Marianne Hirsch, who is now a professor of comparative literature and gender studies at Columbia University in New York. She first proposed this term post-memory in an argument about the role of photographs in Art Spiegelman's original graphic treatment of the Holocaust, Mouse. By this term, Hirsch was trying to identify, and I, I know this is a mouthful, so I've got it there on the first line, an intersubjective transgenerational space of remembrance linked to cultural or collective trauma, which is not strictly based on identity or on familial connections. In Hirsch's conception, post-memory is distinguished from memory by generational distance and from history by a deep personal connection. So it's neither memory nor history, right? It's something in between those two things. Post-memory is a powerful and very particular form of memory precisely because its connection to its object or source is mediated not through recollection, but through an imaginative investment and creation. And that's a quote from Marianne. Now, in my own work, um, 
studying both the psychotherapeutic research and memoir-like texts of children of survivors, and that's when the first side of your handout comes in. Those are some of the texts I've been working with. I found numerous parallel definitions and echoes of what Hirsch has termed post-memory. Israeli psychoanalyst Ilani Kogan, for example, describes a patient who felt that he shared his father's secret without really having known it, as if he had always been with his father even before his own birth. That's a very striking image, right? As if he had been with his father even before his own birth. Scholar and fiction writer Lisa Apignanesi labels her experiences as those of transgenerational haunting. In the same passage, she deploys the metaphor of a waterfall, suggesting that memory cascades through the generations in a series of misplaced fears, <laughs> mysterious wounds, or odd habits that a child inhabits. <laughs> Bless you. Author and cultural critic Afa Hoffman describes her memories, not memories, of what happened to her parents as, quote, an enigmatic but real fairy tale and emanations of wartime experiences that kept erupting in flashes of imagery in abrupt but broken refrains. Michael Skagen describes his relation to his Holocaust survivor father's past as the substance of my life which achieved an immediacy as palpable as my own skin. Immediacy as palpable as my own skin. Now, when Marianne Hirsch first described to me her concept of post-memory, it immediately clicked for me. And her words took me back to a feeling, to an affective state that I had not experienced in literally decades. So when I set out to write Daddy's War, I knew that one part of what I wanted and indeed felt I had to try to do was to describe as, price, as precisely as I possibly could my own post memories. And this is how the opening lines of that book came into being. When I was very young, I knew things about my father that had no plot, no narrator, no audience. I don't remember being told these things. They were just there, like unwelcome relatives installed for the long haul, sponging off my parents and preventing our family from living completely in the present. They existed with a level of substantiality equal to that of my ancestresses who had thrown themselves off the cliffs of Suli rather than being taken by the Turks, and of my forefathers who had fought the Trojans. Whereas it was easy to want to make room in our crowded house for the heroines and heroes from Greece, it was a lot harder to live with the war experiences. They took up space, had to be fed, and placated. In their presence, one was supposed to be grateful and shut up. They had names like trapped, abandoned, cheated, terrified, betrayed, and starved. And they were barely kept in check by one called saved. What I want to observe here is that my post memories were more concrete than emanations, and they did not really take the form of Hoffman's images or sounds, refrains. Rather, when to the best of my ability I recollect my infantile experience, I realized that my father's war experiences existed in my own life as affect, as incarnated feelings like beings lodged in our home, contact with which I tried to avoid. Trapped, abandoned, cheated, terrified, betrayed, and starved. These are intense and unpleasant feelings, ones that we would hope no child would be forced to encounter. And yet, I would argue, these and similar emotions are the substance of the lives, as Skaken put it, of probably millions of children who have themselves experienced uh, extreme situations like war, or whose parents did, and who were subsequently unable to work them through unwittingly passing them on to their offspring. There are two additional points I want to make about post-memory. First, parallel to the way that not every individual witnessing a terrifying event will be traumatized by it, not every offspring of every person who's been traumatized will experience the phenomenon of post-memory. Second, post-memories seem to come about in different manners. Hirsch herself seems to at first have conceived of them as unbidden, coming into the child's existence by the flood of stories told by the parental generation. 
Yet Marianne Hirsch has also conceived of post-memory as something that requires imagination and creativity. So while in some cases post-memories seem to be uninvited, they could also be worked towards, almost summoned. Perhaps they can also be consciously or unconsciously imposed. Dina Wardy, an Israeli analyst, has coined the term memorial candle and pointed out that in Holocaust survivor families, there's often one child who becomes the designated bearer of the traumatic memories. This is often the child who is also said to resemble a lost one in the Shoah. Now, in the case of my own family, I believe that all six of us children, I'm, I'm one of six, I have three sisters and two brothers, <coughs> were marked by my father's experiences. The stories that we came to know about the war are connected to aspects of our individual identities. My brothers, for instance, came to learn at a much younger age than any of their older sisters about our father's arrest on the basis of false identification as a Jew. And I just mentioned that this identification took place because he was born in the United States, so he had been circumcised. And no children in Greece were circumcised unless they were Jewish or Muslim. So his circumcision uh, definitely stood out. But because circumcision is a very intimate aspect of bodily identity, um, it was certainly one that was too intimate and too close to any questions of sexuality for him to consciously communicate them to his daughters. So what then of my own post memories? The ones I have cited from the opening of my book are so deep inside me that I suspect they were planted at a very young age. Okay. Indeed, those words that I quoted to you here that are in um, bold, both in this quote, but also in the book itself, I, I trace those words wherever they um, come up. Okay. Um, these were planted in me so early that I do not remember an origin. I do not remember life without these words. Okay. But how about this post-memory of rape? Right. Um, Wardy's idea of the memorial candle of a specific child being designated the bearer of horrid memories from the previous generation receives some support from this case. I, until I did this research, had always assumed that fear of rape was something that all my sisters shared. In fact, I even assumed that our female cousin, the only daughter of my father's directly younger brother, also shared this terror. After consulting those family members, however, I was forced to realize that somehow I was the sole bearer of this disproportionate fear of rape. When this became clear to me, I tried to situate a concrete beginning to my fear, to this particular fear. And though I did not succeed in recalling any direct communication on the subject, I was able to reconstruct that I began to be afraid sometime after I had turned nine years old in May of 1967. I could trace this because I remembered feeling afraid as I was walking around our town alone or was waiting to be picked up from music lessons, two things that I had started to do frequently at that age. Now, in summer of 1967, Newark and New York City, two urban spaces close to our home and with which our father had a lot of contact, experienced race riots. And I remember vaguely being made aware of those riots and their attendant dangers by my father. That I concretely remember him talking to me about. But perhaps more directly relevant is the fact that in summer of 1967, our mother took four of the six children, the two oldest and the two youngest, to visit Greece. That left two of us at home in New York with our father, my younger sister, and myself. By leaving two of us at home in New York, right, my parents succeeded in restaging my paternal grandmother's trip to Greece exactly 30 years later. A young Greek immigrant mother took four children to Greece to visit the parents' families, and the young father stayed in the United States to earn money. I have to tell you that when I first made the connection about these things, I laughed out loud. I couldn't believe it, despite how painful all of this was. There are numerous details I could share with you, but what I count as mainly unconscious traumatic reenactments, right? And let me spell out a few more details. In both 1937 and 1967, Greece was under a dictatorship. Right? The trips appeared to have been preceded by unhappiness within the couples, to name a more internal reason. In the new drama, my father was assigned his own father's role, and I one of substantially helping to keep the truncated family afloat at much too young an age, the way my father had in Greece from 1941 to 1945. 
Given that structure, I'm assuming again, consciously or unconsciously, my own father was forced to feel what his father might have felt under similar circumstances, especially concerns about his wife and her safety, but also about losing her. In looking at me and my nine-year-old efforts to cook, clean, do the laundry, and otherwise keep the household in order, my father must have also been forced to see his own role as a child who's being asked to do things that children generally do not do, and therefore are probably not doing very well. I further surmise that these two levels became painfully enmeshed by the fact that of all six children, I looked then and still do look the most like our mother. My father's own memory of having witnessed a rape or the pimping of sisters by their brothers, um, to put it otherwise, the inability of Kerkyr and brothers to be good providers and caretakers for their sisters, may have reemerged for him during that summer. And again, consciously or unconsciously, he imparted its lessons to me. <coughs> this fear inside of me joined the others that were planted much earlier. They elicited similar affects even if they appear to me now to have rather different provenances. And in this sense, Apinanese's metaphor of the memory cascade comes to mind when I try to describe it. Now, it's embarrassing but honest to admit to you that I first went in pursuit of my father's war stories because of my sense that doing so could help me get rid of the ghosts, the psychological burdens I believed my father had saddled me with. A little less selfishly, I also originally hoped to aid my five siblings in freeing themselves from some of the demons who had latched onto them. Mercifully, once launched, the process of trying to learn as much as I possibly could about what actually had happened to our father during the war helped me develop less egotistical motives. By the time I had finished the research and writing of my book, I believe I had come to understand better the phenomenon of post-memory and also my father. I've tried to share with you this evening some of those ways in which I came to understand the mechanisms of post-memory. As for understanding my father better, this task was achieved in part by simply learning more about what had happened to him and by having empathy about that. More specifically, I tried to co-witness to my father's trauma. Now, co-witnessing is a concept I developed out of psychotherapeutic theory. It concerned, in this specific case, producing a story of my father's trauma, not so much through a mastery of the facts as by testifying to what could and could not be known, to what went wrong, to likely causes, and to appropriate affect around events. I discussed this concept of co-witnessing at length in chapter three of my first book, and an application of it constitutes the last and what I myself consider the most interesting part of Daddy's War. So if you do ever launch yourself into that book, please don't give up until you get to that part, OK? I'm sad to report that my act of co-witnessing does not appear to have helped my father very much. He's happy that the book exists. However, he now suffers from some kind of dementia. And his dementia seems to prevent him from really understanding what I was trying to say. On a more positive note, I want to share that my act of co-witnessing did help me free myself from the emotional grips of my father's war experiences. And furthermore, my siblings have found it to indeed have helped them with their own understanding of our childhood. And a not insignificant number of readers of Daddy's War have contacted me to report that it was helpful to them as well. So that means a lot to me. Beyond any personal psychotherapeutic healing the book may or may not affect, however, I want to follow Judith Herman, Kathy Carruth, Martha Minow, and others in believing that there is a societal benefit to acts of co-witnessing such as mine, in that they acknowledge and bring before the public a more full account of the true cost of war. And I'm sure that true cost of war is something that's very much on all our minds at this moment. I tried to emphasize this benefit by, among other things, dedicating my book to all children who have suffered from somebody's war. To conclude my formal remarks then, my research into my own family history shows that affects engendered by trauma must be given their proper names, trapped, abandoned, cheated, terrified, terrified of rape, betrayed, whatever they actually are for the specific case at hand. And they then must be removed from the living rooms or other spaces of the present and placed back into the past, into the specific events of the past which gave rise to them in the first place. This is what I tried to do in my book. 
I end by sharing that the affect of the aftermath of such co-witnessing has indeed been peace. So thank you very much for your kind attention, and I'm very eager to hear what you have to say. <laughs> Great. So um, if anyone knows where the lights are, let's get the lights back on. <laughs> and um, I am, I hope, I, I hope I indicated to you, I am extremely willing to talk about any aspect. Um, I've raised a lot of different subjects. Um, there are a lot of details I didn't go into. And so I'm very willing to talk about anything that any of you want. Uh, the Humanities Council, thank you, uh, gave me a local room. So I'm not in a rush. I don't know when we need to uh, close down the library, but I'm, I'm all ears. Please, sir. Yeah, I actually have two questions. Sure. Uh, I'll try one in the time of life. OK. Uh, you commented about the shift over time mm -hmm. in the story from a single individual. Yes. And you showed different source materials yes. in your father's case. Mm -hmm. uh, been quoted and having seen others quoted in newspaper articles yes. uh, over time, I'm wondering how much of your conclusion, in your conclusion, you have been able to tease out the question of the interviewee versus the skill and goals of the interviewer. Mm -hmm. Um, that's a great question. So it's about those um, stories over time, those uh, diachronous uh, stories. Um, and particularly, you noticed appropriately that some of those are from newspapers. Um, the young student journalist of the high school newspaper, for example, got things so mixed up, it was hysterical. Um, so, um, But even in her mix-ups, I recognized some um, displacements my own father had done. Um, I, and I could go into some details. But the, the question really concerned trying to tease out what um, someone might have said and what the interviewer turned it into, right? And I have myself been uh, misquoted many times, in the, not many times, but a few times, a few critical times in the paper. Um, and I know how painful that can be. So I had a lot of skepticism, but I read through that. For ex I'll give you a couple of concrete examples. In the 1945 story, um, and this might be something some of you can help me with, um, it says that his adventures were like Jack Armstrong. Well, I had no clue who Jack Armstrong was and had to check it with an American specialist. OK, excuse me? Yes. So I am positive that that was an imposition by the journalist. There's no way my father could have known. My father left the United States uh, when he was six years old, okay, and he had just gotten back, and there was no way that American media was reaching Greece during the war years, okay? So that was just a very, very clear um, indication that the journalist had imposed a metaphor that he thought would make sense to his readers, right? So he heard the story, it sounded like Jack Armstrong to the journalist, and he used that metaphor. So I tried to do that with a lot of different things. Even my father is quoted in that interview as saying, He's speaking about the terrible inflation of money that took place in Greece. And he said, you needed a car to move your money. Well, my father had never seen a car in Greece in that period. I'm absolutely positive. There were no private cars. I mean, um, his father did own a car when he got back. So I'm sure the idea of car made a huge impression on him, that his father was wealthy enough to own a car. But his saying that people were moving money by car was absolutely false. He himself stuffed money that he earned in Athens into potato sacks and then sent those potato sacks of money back to his mother in the village by boat. Um, so, uh, but that's not in the article because, you know, Americans' potato sacks money, I mean, it probably didn't add up very well. So your point is extremely well taken. And uh, one, as a, as a researcher, you have to read through all kinds of things like that. Do you want to ask your second question? Yeah. Okay. Second question is you commented that uh, PTSD is more likely to occur in person against person mm -hmm. trauma versus in natural mm -hmm. disasters. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering why you think 
Well, it's not my personal opinion. There are lots of statistics about that. Yeah. Um, let me be very, very clear that some of the original trauma um, research was done in the wake of uh, natural violence. Uh, well, semi-natural violence. This is, this is a really interesting example. Has anyone heard of the Buffalo Creek disaster? Yes. Yes, OK. So this was a terrible flood that occurred as a result of negligence of mine companies, OK? And unfortunately, we've had recurls. Uh, many, many people who witnessed that flood uh, went into post-traumatic state. Um, but what seems to have made it worse was when people found out that the mine, that it was not just a natural disaster, it was the mine company, okay, and negligence on the part of the mine company. Now, we've just had some terrible disasters, natural disasters, right? Earthquakes, floods, um, tornadoes being the most recent. Um, and for sure, those can provoke PTSD. But in terms of percentages, it seems to be human on human violence because of that idea that someone did it on purpose. Whereas when an earthquake strikes, most people today anyway don't think um, somebody had something to do with that, right? So if it's truly a natural disaster, it can for sure trigger PTSD, but the incidence statistically is less than with um, human perpetrated violence. And that's, again, that's not my own opinion. It's, there's lots of statistical data about that. Other questions or comments? Sir? The, the story, the same story over time, does it change at all from level of detail or emphasis? Or is there the, the general loading the memory so it's less detail? Well, later on? as this gentleman already pointed out, I have to, I don't have the story in exactly the same form, right? Um, journalists picked out pieces of it that they wanted to tell. Um, the interviews I conducted with my own father were very extensive. Um, there were about 12 of them over a period of two years. Um, but he was already slipping into dementia. So I'm reading, you're, you're never, it's never purely, you know, you can never be sure what you've got um, on your hand. Um, I mentioned the issue of concentration camp, that that word concentration camp is not in the 45 um, narrative. It is in the 65 narrative. Um, uh, later, it, it turns into arrest again. It started as arrest, back into arrest, and in the middle, it's concentration camp. Um, one of my own surmises about that is that my, uh, White Plains, New York, for those of you who know, is the county seat of Westchester County. There are a lot of Jewish Americans. There are particularly a lot of survivors of the Holocaust in that area. And my father not only had a lot of Jewish colleagues at school, he was a school teacher, but he also did graduate work at Yeshiva University. So uh, my surmise is that in making Jewish American friends, he heard stories about what had happened to either them or their families or their extended families um, that he had not heard while he was in Greece, and that um, he developed a vocabulary, and of course the term concentration camp comes into, Holocaust studies as a whole comes in only in the late 60s, 70s. So he was, had much more of a chance to hear that vocabulary, and it was probably a framework that made sense to him, whereas he had no way to explain. Greece was so far, I mean one of the reasons I wrote this book was just to tell people more about what happened in Greece in the Second World War. Most Americans do not have much of a sense of how the war unfolded in the Balkans. And um, so when he was probably trying to tell his story, people didn't know what he was talking about. They couldn't follow it. What do you mean 1941? You know, the war started in 1939, right? Um, what do you mean it ended in 44? You know, the war ended in 45. So um, there are a whole series of things that people around him probably want to understand. And similarly, there were all kinds of things he didn't understand himself. The politics in Greece in this period could keep us here until tomorrow morning. Um, there were a lot of different resistance groups uh, fighting each other, um, and those uh, he he was probably not witness to the actual assassination, but an individual who was actually distantly related to him was assassinated by communist rivals. Okay, so that man was a resistor. He was a Republican. Um, there were also royalists in the area. <coughs> And these stories of my father, he has it mixed up, who was royalist, who was Republican, et cetera. And that's not so surprising for a 14-year-old or a 13-year-old caught in a civil war, right? I mean, I don't think, especially when his main goal is just to keep alive, I think he cooperated with anyone who would give him food. I don't think he had a set of political beliefs. So. Um, 
that was imp and because when he got to this country, nobody knew those details. He could just tell it any way he remembered. <coughs> nobody ever tried to correct him, right? So those things stayed in his in his mind. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Um, that's a really, really good question, and I don't have a definitive answer to it. Um, I do think that um, he said you have to be very afraid of men. Um, so I definitely uh, had I can I, that I can remember, you know, uh, being afraid of men. What I don't understand is, myself is how the actual word rape was was uttered, and it may not have been, you know. Um, but I had, um, I do mention this in the book, I didn't mention it to you tonight, but I, I, one of the reasons I knew there was a problem here is because I do remember very distinctly as I was walking around my town, um, especially when it would get to be dusk, you know, I would say, uh, please, dear God, please let me make love to somebody before I'm raped. So, and, and you know, I was a very young girl at the time. So I, I knew that somehow love and and rape were connected, but I didn't understand <coughs> how. And I, and um, and the phrase was before I am raped. Mm -hmm. So there was no question that was going to happen to me, and it was just an issue of which thing would happen first. So um, I think there was a level, probably, of subconscious fear in my father um, that that we have some other indications of that as his daughters started to turn into women, that was a very frightening moment for him. But post memory, in the sense that I grew up with it, um, this is also an interesting aspect of the book and of the research of the book, is that I, as you heard in the excerpt that I read from the beginning, I had no conscious memory when I started to do this work of ever hearing my father tell these stories. I just knew they were kicking around. And the opening part of the book, which I worked very, very hard at, and I, act, you know, we always have regrets about books we write, but. Um, I actually feel pretty good about the opening of the book because what I tried to show is how those feelings turned into narratives and that the <clears throat> narratives got more elaborate as my own cognitive abilities got more sophisticated. So already as a child, I was adding different levels of detail. But the kernel for it was there from the start. And I think that was just how my father behaved in certain circumstances. For example, and this um, some people unfortunately will be familiar with, um, the, the relationship to food is very, very <coughs> obsessive um, for people who have been in a, in a starved or semi-starved state. And this is reported in almost every uh, story of Holocaust survivors, and it certainly applied to my own father. Greece had very, very bad starvation because of the way the war started. The Italians rushed in at the Albanian-Greek border in harvest season. And so um, the, the crops were not harvested that fall. And there was a terrible winter. And so people ate what they had. And so there was no seed to plant the next fall. And so um, the next fall, there was no crop. And that following winter, then there was people were dropping dead in the streets in Athens. It had a lot to do with how the war unfolded. It also had to do with how the Germans and Italians were administering the country. There was food in the country, but it was not uh, being distributed. So here's another thing about my dad's area. You saw all those gorgeous olive trees. When I went back to his area, which I did not know well, partly because of all this history that was hiding there that he had not talked to us about, um, when I went back to his area and I talked about my family starving, you know, everyone said to me, oh, your family suffered, your family suffered. But I couldn't make it out because they were also telling me we were drowning in oil, and oil was the currency, right? So on the one hand, they're all telling me they were drowning in oil. And the other hand, they're confirming that my family suffered very, very badly. Well, if you didn't own olive trees yourself, you had absolutely nothing to barter with. And because my grandparents had gotten married and then left for the United States, and my grandmother's father was a shoemaker, um, my, grandmother's, my grandfather's parents, uh, his father died very, very young, which is one of the reasons he left for the United States anyway. And his widowed mother owned no property. So, 
my family was not propertied. So if you didn't have a place to grow crops, you had nothing, absolutely nothing. So my father, you know, uh, rented himself out on, on fishing boats, for example, and then would sell the fish so they could buy bread, right? Yeah. Um, so it, it, the starvation there was, was very bad. I'm sorry, I did lose my thread. Was I supposed to be going somewhere? Okay. Other questions or comments? I, I do know. Yes, please. I don't know. Um, I'm not a psychotherapist, but in um, what's in German, it's called Familienaufstellung, systemic mm -hmm. psychotherapy, the concept of the memorial candle yes. exists. Did you make the link, or did you take that? Uh, I'm not sure I know the German literature, actually. I just know the Israeli literature on that uh -huh. issue. Yeah, I'd love to get a reference from you mm -hmm. afterwards. Yeah. And um, why do you think you studied German? Yeah, this was a funny thing. This is, this is in the book partly, too. Yeah. Well, the reason I thought I was studying German was um, because my two older sisters had studied French. I'm the third daughter, and they were both very good students, and I wanted to do my own thing. And um, German, I'd be really curious about places that all of you come from, but German in my high school had been suspended during the First World War, and it had never been taught until I was in the 70s at the age to start learning a foreign language. So it, they were offering this new language. Unfortunately, in my corner of America, there was a lot of prejudice against Spanish, so it was considered, which is the stupidest thing I learned many years later when I finally learned Spanish, um, but it was considered kids who were not smart learned Spanish, and kids who were smart learned French, and I didn't want to learn French because my sisters had learned French, so that's how I learned German. That's what I thought. And then much later, I learned all this other history. So. No, and I, I really, my father was a very, very difficult man um, when he was in his right mind, um, but, uh, <laughs> but I, I always knew that that was very special. I did know he had suffered at the hands of the Nazis, and I really commended him. He never said a single thing to me about getting very, ultimately very involved with German. Um, and do you think you were on a subconscious mission to find out what happened to your father so you could go to the archives in Germany? No, no. no. That, that would be taking it too far, I think. Please. Um, you alluded to your mother as mm -hmm. um, coming from Greece as well. Was she, what was the age difference? I mean, did she ever talk about her wartime experiences? Mm -hmm. I knew more about my mother's wartime experiences than my dad. My father was born in late 29. My mother was born in June 33. Um, so she was pretty young. But she had a lot of very vivid memories of the war. Her island, um, maybe it's worth trying to, I don't know if we can, we have to go back really fast to the map. Let's see. Um, my mother's from the island of Andros, uh, which is, oops, which is uh, marked here. Um, this is the Cyclades group here. Um, and the northernmost island in that group is called Andros, and she's from the port village, which is called Ravrio. Um, this is Mykonos, for those of you who might know the tourist side of Greece. Um, so uh, the Cyclades were uh, occupied first by the Italians until the Italian capitulation, and then um, they were occupied by the Germans. Um, there was an Italian officer who realized how smart my mother was and started teaching her Italian, and she had very, very fond memories of interaction with the Italians. Uh, the Germans were much more brutal occupiers. They confiscated food primarily. There wasn't too much direct violence. Um, but uh, she, I heard some of these stories. So the critical story for my mother that I alluded to of betrayal which I had never heard as a betrayal story again until very, very late. I knew the story, but not in the framework of betrayal. Um, was that um, they, like all other families, they did have land. And so they grew products and made oil every fall. And they would hide it so that it wouldn't be confiscated, because there was a certain demand to give a certain amount of food anyway. So people would hide as much as they could so that the food that was confiscated was a smaller percentage of what they actually had. So one day, her um, mother sent her to retrieve some oil from the hiding place. And she had been playing with a girlfriend whose parents were presumed to be collaborators or informers. Mm -hmm. And um, my mother was, I think, seven at the time. 
let's see, 33, 87. Yeah, no, probably a little older. So she was probably eight or nine at the time. So she was still fairly young, but she had this girlfriend whose parents were so evidently, they, since they'd been playing and she had this task to do, she went with the other girl to a certain spot. And then my mother said, OK, you wait here. And then my mother disappeared and got the oil and then came back. Well, evidently, her sister, her older sister, saw that the other child had been with her, even though my mother did not let her see where the hiding place was. And so she reported to her father that Lucy had been um, playing with this girl and had you know, revealed the stent and family. And then my grandfather evidently gave my mother a beating um, that was so bad that she couldn't spare her lie for two weeks. And she never forgave her father that beating. And so one of the reasons she ended up leaving Greece was just to get away from her father, which was quite a few years later. But she, you know how those things can happen in childhood. Mm -hmm. And she regretted it very much when her dad died. And did your parents, do you think, ever talk very much? in her memory those stories that he had shared with her in the early years. Um, there's a very complicated story about my father's probable arrest due to the circumcision. And um, it was very complicated trying to tease that out with my mother because she had heard his stories so much and she could no longer place them chronologically when she had heard what. Um, um, because I, I'm just thinking about um, my my parents both lived through the war in London, but years before my brother and I were born, although my sisters were born, mm -hmm. and then my father wouldn't, he was in the RAF, and he wouldn't say anything, anything about mm. what he did a little bit when I was much older, mm -hmm. and going to France and Germany, mm -hmm. tiny bits, and when my father came here to the United States, he told people things that I had never heard, mm -hmm. but things that little bits that I knew I'd heard from my mother. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and my sister, uh, there are six of us, so one of the interesting aspects of the book, I think, <laughs> is to see who remembered what. Mm -hmm. And my oldest sister, even though we're very, very close, um, all of you moms out there, we got Mother's Day coming up, my mother gave birth to four girls in four years. I don't know how she did that. <laughs> so we are, we're extremely close in age. And so because we're so close in age, I. I always assumed we all had the same memories, we all had the same feelings, and when I did this work, it was shocking how different what we knew, how we felt about it, the level of detail. <coughs> and for sure, my oldest sister, who's only two and a half years older, she knew tons of stories I had never heard. And not only that, she remembered how she had heard them. So this is, this is the, um, you can say Teufelskreis, the devil's circle, or you can call it something else. But this work is very, very hard to do, because as soon as someone articulates a story, we tend to incorporate it into our own memories. And, th and in the case of my sister describing places where my dad had told these stories to other individuals, he never told them to us. But we were present when he was telling them to other people. And as soon as my sister said that, this visualization of those places and actually the sound of my father's voice came back to me. It was very uncanny. Um, and I realized, of course, I had been witness to some of those stories. Um, so I, what you're saying makes a lot of sense to me. And I think it happens to many of us. I'll just give you one more quick. There's a lot about how memory functions in this book. And I, um, I hope it's pretty interesting. But here's another story about that. My father's sister, in addition to my mother, my father's sister, who was quite young. She was born in 1934, May of 19. Yeah, 1934. Um, she uh, had a, a lot of stories. She's a great storyteller. She goes on and on and on about all kinds of things. She's a wonderful storyteller. Um, so she was telling me all kinds of things. But again, I had to say, now where did she get that? Did she get that from my grandmother telling her those stories later? Did she actually remember them from then? Did she invent them, as my father certainly did, some of the aspects of his stories based on historical knowledge that he had later? You know. Um, 
And so it's really hard to tease out. Like when I, I shared with you my sense that my mother was literally like a recorder playing back my father's voice with that, can you imagine? Um, I had to try to find those moments where something about the moment, something about the words that were used or the phrases um, made me think, oh my god, I've hit rock bottom. That's, that's history. That's as close as we're ever going to get to it. And those moments are very, very hard to find. But with my aunt, it was hysterical because you know, she was telling me so much and I didn't know what to do with all of it. Well, at, when I was speaking to my aunt, I was reporting to her also on my own trip to Greece. And I had had contact. There was a very uh, complicated story. It took me a long time to work it out that why my grandmother actually went back to Greece in 1937. And eventually, um, a series of papers emerged that absolutely no one knew was in existence, that my great-grandparents had uh, mortgaged their house to loan sharks, and the rate of interest was so high that my grandfather, despite how little he had, so the, the son-in-law, bailed out his in-laws with money he had sent from the United States to Greece. And they thought the house now belonged to them unless they could get repaid. So then they find out that the, their parents, right, uh, my great grandparents, are going to give that house as a dowry to my grandmother's younger sister. So my grandmother goes racing back to Greece to claim the property. I mean, again, my, the mother's in the room. I appeal to you. You know, she had just given birth. I mean, she had just, she went off with a three month old infant, right? And her own body, I mean, but they, they must have been terrified that the biggest investment they had made in their life was. Well, the reason I'm mentioning that quite interesting detail is because um, there was a cache of papers about, about the house. And that house eventually came into the possession of a first cousin of my aunt and my father. And I found out that the sister, who wrongly inherited that house and then died very, very old, much older than my grandmother, that she was being taken care of by this first cousin of my father. So um, she had a very strained relationship to her own children. Two of those children had already died. The third one had disowned her. Um, so, which was another thread of the rape story. I'm, I hope I'm piquing your interest because I can't, I can't unpack it all. Um, but in any case, this house ended up in the possession of this first cousin. So I told my aunt, and I have in the book a quote where my aunt says, and I forgot who it was recently who told me, but Olga inherited the house, you know? And I, I, I mean, I, and I, it seemed so natural the way she said it, so authoritative that it was only months later that I realized I was the one who told her that Olga inherited the house. Anyway, so there's, there's a lot of fun things about memory. Go ahead. Yeah. Thank you for being here. This is a real history, and I'm just a fake one. Okay. I'm going to ask uh, sort of a slightly delicate um, subject of um, question that I'm sure you have asked mm -hmm. for, um, in terms of telling this very daring story about your father and teasing out mm -hmm. this. Um, and that is, um, well, well, let me say, one, you believe your father, right, in terms of, like, you have faith in him in terms of telling a story about him that that's, is trying to understand him. He's 14 years old, so he's a kid, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and he's in the middle of, 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 of this incredible moment. Mm -hmm. So part of that sort of believing what he's saying, I, I'm, I'm wondering, part of me is wondering, like what part in your father's memory or his life does guilt play a role? I'm interested in like teasing out his relationship to the boys that were pimping. Did he know them? Were they his friends? Did mm -hmm. he, did no, he, because he was, he was in a different place. I mean, he was definitely in a different place. Um, it's really interesting. I mean, believe, I believe my father, that's not actually a phrase I would ever use. Um, yeah, and, uh, and uh, for all kinds of reasons. Um, I have lots of documented stories that he's not telling the truth. Um, there is a little bit of information that you will never find out more about. Um, where I caught my father doing something illegal, essentially, in the historical record. And um, for reasons that I suspect lots of people in the room could understand, I decided that I had no business making right. that. 
public. Um, but it was very disconcerting to find out this side of my father. Now, again, those of you who uh, may have Holocaust survivors in the family, you, people were put in situations where the only way to survive the situation was to do something that under moral codes we would normally not do. And there are things like survivor's guilt. Um, that's not actually something I have been able to add to this picture. I don't see survivor's guilt per se. There, there is a slightly different kind of guilt that um, I think you have enough pieces of the story to understand. This whole issue that I just told you about the house and why on earth did my grandmother leave with these four kids in the first place, my father believed that it was his fault. And partly because his mother told him it was his fault. So one of the reasons that was given for why they went to Greece was that my father was misbehaving in school. So he had just started school. He had just started school in Newark. He has two Greek immigrant parents. He doesn't speak English very well. Um, he seems to have been born a wisecracker. I mean, he seems to have been born, you know, one of those problematic boys. Um, and who knows why that is. Um, so it, like, uh, anyone here from Newark, New Jersey? There's a, there's a statue of Abraham Lincoln. And at some point, he took a knife and he cut off one of the fingers of the Abraham Lincoln statue. OK, so I mean, he seems to have been kind of a troublemaker. But in the worst of what they experienced, evidently, my grandmother said to him, it's your fault that we're here. You know. And I mean, to be in a war zone and have tell someone tell you, you know, it's your fault. I mean, so, and he, would, he could still make those articulations to me that it was their fault. So in that sense, there was guilt. But I don't think there was survivor guilt in the sense that we might know it. Does that answer your yeah, question a little exactly, bit? Yeah, OK. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, here's something where I don't believe him, I couldn't believe him because the historical record didn't support it. That might be interesting to you. So we'll go back to um, this map, right? So there over here, and here's Athens. And when my grandmother finally realizes how dangerous the situation is getting, she tries to leave the country. I mean, this is a very poignant moment for me because um, uh, I can only imagine what that felt like to have these four little children who have American passports and to try to get out of the country. So a story my father does tell is that they fled this area with their mother. They went through Thebes. And in Thebes, that's the historical Thebes, right? So all this mythological res resonance, that in Thebes, they saw uh, German paratroopers. They saw parachutists um, in the attack on Athens. Okay, And they had to turn back. Okay. Um, the reality, the fact, uh, the family fact is I, that they didn't get out of the country. Okay. The historical facts are there's a big mountain range in between Thebes and Athens. So um, they wouldn't have seen what was happening in Athens anyway. And after a lot of trouble consulting some of the world's best historians on the Second World War and on the German Luftwaffe, there were no um, parachutists used in this aspect of um, the assault on Greece. However, there was a very dramatic takeover securing of the Corinth Canal by German parachutists. And I bet some people in the room know what I'm going to say next, which was there was a hugely spectacular and devastating attack on Crete where the Germans sent in 10,000 parachutists. Okay. And there were huge loss of life um, on the parts of the Brits, the, Cre the Cretans, and the Germans. I and mean, this is one of the biggest debacles of the Second World War. In fact, at that point, Hitler decided he would not ever use parachutists in the same way in an assault mission. Um, so it's extremely possible that my father heard about one of these uses of parachutists, which would have been very dramatic for the Greeks, who you know, didn't have very many airplanes themselves, OK? Um, and that he incorporated into something else he saw in Thebes, because Thebes would have logically been the, play, the way they would have tried to get to the port to get out of the country. So I don't doubt that they were in Thebes. Um, I don't doubt that they saw something terrible there that made my grandmother decide it was more frightening to try to go forward than to go backward. Um, but he could not have seen parachutists there. And when I challenged him on that, he said, I don't care what you say. 
that's what I saw. So I don't consider that a lie, you know, right? That is what happens to memory. We put two things together. I think that was so dramatic to hear about those parachutists, and they became part of his memory. Now, interestingly, when I talked to local eyewitnesses to the German assault on Thebes, they said that the Germans dropped Stuckas, right? So they dropped bombs, and they said the way those bombs hit the earth, the earth sprung up like this. So it seems to me extremely, because my father says, I was sitting in a bus and we saw, you know, so it sounds extremely possible to me that he saw things in the air, you know, um, because the earth was literally being displaced. And that that then merged hearing this dramatic news just a few weeks later about the attack in Corinth or a few weeks more later, the attack in Crete. Um, sorry, that was a side note. But, uh, yes? Question from a little different area. You mentioned the VA at White River yes. was a, a center of research. Yes. And I was curious, what kinds of things were they doing? And is trauma trauma, or does each war produce a different kind? Mm -hmm. or what are the implications of their research? That's a great, great question. So let me take a couple of pieces of it. Um, one piece, I mentioned to you this alliance between feminists and um, Vietnam War vets. Um, one of the things that was incredibly um, revolutionary, I think we can really say, and significant about the diagnosis of PTSD finally becoming official is that the symptomology, so what the, the actual problems that people display tend to be incredibly similar no matter how the trauma was inflicted. So if you were raped, if you were uh, the victim of a violent assault, if you are in a war, um, if you're in an earthquake, the way our psyches seem to process those extreme overwhelming of ordinary experience um, seem to result in very similar symptoms. So. Um, Wars often produce veterans with very, very similar problems. Um, that said, of course, there are always uh, individual characteristics, and there are things people are subjected to in some wars that they're not in others, right? Um, so of course, the First World War, when we first get research in this area, has the terrible mustard gas. Um, this, the witnessing of that, um, the physical scars of people who were exposed even mildly, um, that has a certain characteristic the same way Agent Orange has another set of characteristics, right? And uh, Lord knows what our boys are coming home with now, and our women too, actually. I mean, that's just, to up, yeah. You know, if there were lessons for the Iraq. Well, for one thing, um, empathy. You know, I think that as a society, we have to have enormous understanding for um, the damage that it has been done to these individuals. And um, now that doesn't mean we can allow them to, you know, kill their children or um, assault their intimate partners or uh, commit other types of crime. But I think we need we need more resources. We need more resources for mental health for for vets for sure. And there are a huge number of them now, huge number. And Vermont, of all places, you know, we have a huge number of vets right here. So. Can you speak a bit uh, to the memory of children and what is, how, what is important and beneficial um, for the healing of a child's mind? That's great. This is a great question about children specifically. And those of you who do need to go, I completely understand. I think Chris is going to shut us down soon anyway. But let me, let me take up that issue of children because it is a theme in what I've been trying to share with you. Um, here, some incredibly important work has been done by Robert Coles. Um, uh, uh, um, a psychiatrist in Boston. He's associated with the Harvard Medical School. And he wrote a very, very important series about children, right? Um, children of affluence, children of poverty, children in North Ireland. Um, and for me, uh, one of the most significant parts of that research that was ever shared had to do with children in the South in the era of civil rights, trying to gain civil rights. And what they observed is that children who were put into very, very frightening situations situations, all right, we're told to go into these schools, were attacked by dogs, hoses, etc. that the children who had some adult in their life who was confirming how scary it was did better than children who were told not to be afraid, okay? So in other words, we seem to need a kind of confirmation that this is a very difficult situation. Um, I'm scared too. Uh, but we're together. So it's not to not have any hope, 
but to <coughs> confirm the reality of what they're going through. So our whole notions of, you know, real men don't cry, and, and the, this actually appear, uh, appears to be very psychically unhealthy. And so this particularly applies to children. They need, a, because usually children's fantasies are even worse than the reality. So it's better to confirm the reality and that the reality is frightening, but that uh, we're going to try to get through it. Not false hopes, but we're going to try. And I'm going to stick with you as much as I can. Yeah. Yes? Um, I understand that's one reason that child sexual abuse is so pervasive in the because it's usual, and not only is it done to immature brains and bodies, but uh, when it's kept a secret. Mm -hmm. and right. Young children right. have a hard time already distinguishing mm -hmm. between male and male. Right. And to but tie it back into children of Holocaust no survivors way. is very often the parents don't say what's going on. Right. So that is more frightening because they may hear their parents moaning in the night. They may see their parents eating obsessively. Um, they may uh, be dressed by the parents, you know, overprotectively. Uh, stories of children being forced to wear four and five coats because the parents don't want them to be cold. You know, so that they're living the effects of the trauma, but nothing's being said about it. And so that's a much more difficult situation. And for sure, the secrecy of don't tell anyone. This is part of the most most dramatic uh, or damage if you, we if do. Parents have been traumatized and they won't tell. Right. Because it's too hard. For them. Right. People think they're protecting their children, and it turns out that most, uh, this psychotherapeutic community is not completely unanimous on this, but most psychotherapists think that um, talking is better than silence. Yeah. Great. Um, with that, maybe we should create some silence. I, I, is that? I'm sure uh, you may have a, a few moments to stick around and answer some yes. more questions. Yes, yes, absolutely. Can, can I say thank you? What an interesting oh, conversation. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you very, very much.